Okay, 2 John. Now, I'm going to look at 2 and 3 John. What I want to say about 2 John and 3 John is first I want to talk about the authorship. Now, I don't know if this kind of stuff, you care about this. You may just say, okay, they're all written by John. That's fine. I accept that. Let me just briefly tell you, how do you get there? How do you conclude that 2 and 3 John are, in fact, written by the Apostle John? Now, the author in 2 and 3 John, he refers to himself only as the elder. That's all you get. He refers to himself only as the elder. So why think that he's the Apostle John? Well, there are good reasons for that. And the starting place for inferring that the elder is the Apostle John is that the author of the Gospel of John was almost certainly the Apostle John. Now, I don't want to take the time to go through the evidence and arguments for the case that the Gospel of John was almost certainly written by the Apostle John. So let me just give you a statement from the New Testament introduction by two well-known New Testament scholars, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo, and they say, in short, so I'm just giving you their summary without giving you all the stuff behind it, okay? This is a shortcut. All right, in short... The most straightforward reading of the evidence is still the traditional one. It is highly probable that John, the son of Zebedee, wrote the fourth gospel. All right, so in saying, well, how do you get to the idea that second and third John were written by the apostle John? The starting point is the high probability that the gospel of John was written by the apostle John. And then second, as I said in the introduction to first John, which you, of course, will not remember, but it seems clear that 1 John was written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John. 1 John was written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. So therefore, 1 John was written by the Apostle John. Well, why do you think 1 John was written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John? It's indicated by the similarities in Greek style and vocabulary, the conceptual parallels between the two involving things like light, darkness, life, truth, world, word. You see, all of these conceptual parallels exist in 1 John and in the Gospel of John. And there is in 1 John uh, and, and the Gospel of John, there are many identical or near identical clauses and phrases. You see, all of which indicates that we're dealing with the same author. And the fact that he describes himself as an eyewitness of Jesus fits with his being an apostle. Okay, so 1 John, written by the the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. And based on the things I just told you why you would think that, it's not surprising that it was the unanimous view of the early church that 1 John was written by the Apostle John. Okay, so that's, that's a little external piece of information. Gospel of John, Apostle John. First John, same person who wrote that, for those reasons, early church recognized that John wrote the gospel and he wrote First John. Third piece of the puzzle is that Second John clearly seems to have been written by the same person who wrote First John. Clearly seems to have been written. The author of Second John, he deals with the same historical situation as, as you know, but as we, we'll see when we go through it. He deals with the same historical situation reflected in First John. And as in 1 John, he labels the false teachers antichrists, you see, or antichrist. See, and that's the, those are the only times, 1 John, and in these other letters of John, that's the only time that specific term is used in the New Testament. You see, so you see, that's a clear link that you're dealing with the same guy, because he's using that, right? He's using that term. He stresses the importance of the love command, as, you, as we saw in 1 John, right? He stresses that. He does that again in 2 John. And he refers to the joy of fellowship in the truth, as you saw in 1 John. He keeps telling them, you know, the truth. We are of the, of the orthodox, faithful. Watch these people who are not. We have this bond because we are one in the truth, one in Christ, one in the gospel. And so you see that same thing. Now, 3 John is clearly written by the same person who wrote 2 John. Gospel, 1 John, same guy, 2 John, same guy, 1 John, 3 John, same guy, 2 John. 
Okay, it's written, it's written by the same person. There are stylistic similarities. The repetition of his joy over the children walking in the truth that you see in 2 John. You see that. And the fact the author is identified in both 2 and 3 John as what? The elder. All right, that's a very unusual argument. So you see all of those things point to 3 John, same author as 2 John. 2 John, same author as 1 John. 1 John, same author as God. So the, the bottom line is that. The Apostle John is the author of the Gospels and the Epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That shouldn't shock you. You've probably thought that all your life. But I want to tell you that. I'll give you a little bit more. That's how you get there. And I'm sure there's much more that could be said on that, but you're probably already to pass out over this. All right. Now, why he calls himself the elder in 2nd and 3rd John he calls himself the elder there, but nowhere else. That's unclear. You see, I mean, you just have the fact that he does it, and you don't have an explanation of why he's doing it. It's unclear, but that, that, that fact doesn't overturn the conclusion of common authorship of all of them because you can think of reasons why he may do that, right? I mean, maybe John came to be known in some quarters, some locales, Maybe he came to be known as the elder, you see, to indicate his distinction as the last remaining apostle. Maybe he came to be known in certain quarters as the elder for that reason, you see. So that's, that's something that's possible. And that title wouldn't have been appropriate in the gospel or in 1 John because those writings had a different or a wider initial audience. So it wouldn't have been appropriate for him to use that title if that title was restricted. In other words, if, if he was known that way here, but not other places where the gospel may have initially been sent or where 1 John may have initially been sent. Okay, so I can think of reasons for it, but, I, you know, that's just speculation. Now, 2 and 3 John, especially 2 John, they clearly relate to the same historical situation as 1 John, as you know, and, but as we'll see. As we go through the letter. Now, you, you recall from the introduction of 1 John, well, you may not recall, but the introduction of 1 John, you see that, it, which was probably written from Ephesus in the early 90s. Yeah, I hope you'll, you'll recall that, but recall that it doesn't open like a normal first century Greek letter. You see, there are styles, just like we have letter styles, dear somebody. You know, and you've got, depending if it's a business letter and all, you know, you have, we have certain forms and styles that we use. Well, that's true of the ancient world. And 1 John doesn't open like a traditional first century Greek letter. But it clearly was addressed to a specific group of Christians. He's clearly dealing with people he knows and communities writing to who are being threatened by people. Okay, so you say, well, what's going on? Well, a possible explanation for the atypical form of 1 John, why it doesn't look like a typical first century Greek letter, is that it was meant to be circulated to several congregations in an area, and delivery to each was to be accompanied by a short personal note, something like a cover letter. You see, so this would be more general, and then to each congregation, there's this cover letter. And many people think 2 John was just such a cover letter. See, that 2 John was the letter that came to this immediate group. This is going to be going to other people. But here's 1 John, and here's 2 John to this immediate congregation that received it. So that's a possibility. But there's something going on with why that directed to specific group of people, but still not done in the typical letter form. And that's one possibility. All right, 2 John. 2 John, chapter, uh, not chapter, just 2 John, <laughs> verses 1 to 3. The elder to an elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but all who have come to know the truth, because of the truth that lives in us and will be with us forever. With us there will be grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Now the elder, it's not simply a reference to John's age. 
You see, that, it, that idea, the, the, the term, the elder, it's not just about his age. The phrase carries with it a sense of leadership and a sense of authority. It was used that way of religious leaders in both Israel and the church. So it's not simply a statement about age. It carries with it this sense of leadership and authority. And he's writing to the elect lady and her children, See, which almost certainly is a metaphorical reference to a local congregation and its members. You see, to the elect lady, he's writing to a congregation and her children, all of the members of that congregation. John, he's in one local church, as indicated in verse 13, where the children of this lady's elect sister send greetings. See, so John is in one congregation, and he's writing to another congregation, and he's writing to those, the congregation, and to all of the members. You say, well, what's, what's this about the elect? Well, Christian communities, Christian churches are elect or chosen, and that Christians have been chosen by God to receive rich, eternal blessings. I mean, God determined from eternity. He determined, he chose from eternity that those of faith would spend eternity with him in glory. You see, now this is where Arminians, which is typical of churches of Christ, part company with Calvinists, one of the places. Because we look at God's election as conditional. You see, we look at his election in his foreknowledge being conditioned on faith. So the elect are those of faith that he knows come to faith. Where the Calvinists would say it is unconditional. God simply chose individuals in his own counsel uh, for nothing in them for salvation. And then, of course, the footnote is then he chose all the others for damnation. Yes, and so this is the idea. And then God, on behalf of those he in eternity chose, he then irresistibly calls them to faith and then protects them forever. All right, that, you, I, I don't know how much you know about the scheme, but when you say the things I just said, it's worthy of a footnote to say that this is, raises that issue. Okay, but that, that's how I, I, I think this idea of elect, he sees that when he speaks of them as elect or chosen, they are elect or chosen in that God chose those of faith, he elected them for tremendous blessings. And that is what is in store for us. Now John notes that he, he loves in truth the Christians to whom he's writing. And I think that means more than simply he truly or sincerely loves them. Although that's certainly true. He does truly or sincerely love them. I think he means that he loves them as sharers in the truth of Christ. He loves them in the truth. He loves them as those who continue in the faith that binds them together. That's what ties us together. We are all very different. But we are in the truth. We are in Jesus Christ. And it is in that truth that he loves them. See, Christians are a community of love. People who have a commitment to each other and a bond that is like family... See, which is why he adds that they also are loved by all who have come to know the truth. He loves them in the truth. And they're also loved by all who have come to know the truth. All Christians have a bond to each other. And I'll tell you, if Calvin was here, I'd embarrass him. Because I, I just, I've said this to Calvin many times. But they move here from the Northeast. And Calvin and Honor, they're coming here. And he says, listen... Calvin comes expecting a community of Christ. He emails the church and says, we're coming from where he, where he is. And when I came here, he, he came here, and I was in the auditorium when I first met him, and he just walked down, he and I hugged. And I just say, look, you know, never met him before, but I see in him that this person shares the faith in Jesus Christ, and there is a bond. You see, there is a bond, and that's what fellowship is. That's what It is rooted in who Jesus is, that we are one in him. Right. You see, and that's, that's what he's talking about with this love. There's a spiritual bond between all of God's children. We are a brotherhood. 
We are a spiritual family. And John elaborates that the love shared by the saints, it's a product of the truth that lives in us. You see, this fellowship shared by the saints, this love that we share is a product of the truth that lives in us. It is our identity as Christians. Our identity as Christians, those who received in our hearts the gospel of Christ, and in our conversion have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that's what generates the bond or the connection with all other Christians. We have been born anew. We have been born of the Spirit of God. Because of our embrace and reception of the gospel of Christ, we have been regenerated, and we now have this brotherhood and this bond that is here, and it is with every fellow Christian. All who are in Christ. And that's something that is powerful. And this truth of Christ, he says, it will be with us forever. Did the second bell ring and I missed it? Okay. This is the, this is the truth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's messing with me. I think he heard me and said, okay, I'll get him now. All right. Thanks for coming. What the game plan is, I, I think it's going to take me two more weeks to get through second and third John. So two more weeks, second and third John, then archaeology and the Bible. All right. Thanks for coming.